This is where the journey begins for so many people around the world. When I say journey, I mean the first foray into formal wine training. Some 117,000 students took a Wine and Spirit Education Trust qualification in 2021 to 22. Level 2 is the most popular jumping in point. It's a prerequisite for climbing the WSET rungs, whereas Level 1, a simple, fun, one-day course, is optional. So with thousands enrolled at any one time and a heap more weighing it up, I thought it was worth giving you a taste of what it entails. I'm a WSET accredited educator, but this isn't a sales pitch. Its purpose is to show the breadth of the course as it stands in mid-2023. That is to say the topics covered and outcomes expected. Finding virtue in this course isn't to say it's perfect. As always, Vin Inspo advocates an open mind and constructive approach. Before they begin, students receive a workbook and course textbook, Looking Behind the Label. It's an ostensibly bland subtitle, but behind the uh, label lurks significance. One of the unifying features of this course is the way it opens people's eyes to the real, meaningful factors hiding in plain sight that genuinely influence the quality, style and price of a bottle of wine. Those factors are many, varied and interlaced, and we investigate them across several different grape varieties and regions across the world, via wines of different quality levels and price points. In many cases, we learn how to infer those factors and anticipate their impact from cues that appear on a wine label. In my experience, people find the course satisfying because of its scope, the number of secrets it unlocks. It's an eight session series, each running for two hours in the classroom, incorporating tutored tastings of illustrative wines. In addition, students are expected to do 11 hours of self-study, including preparation, consolidation and revision before a one hour exam comprising 50 multiple choice questions. Session one includes the course induction and tasting technique. An important component of WSET is the systematic approach to tasting or SAT. Outsiders tend to be critical of the way this constricts tasters to a relatively rigid framework, apparently smoothing over the complexities of a wine's interplay with our senses. But once again, the SAT doesn't pretend to be perfect. It's a tool with a great many benefits, both for assessing a wine in the moment and, crucially, for building a meaningful memory bank from which students can draw accurate inferences and confident conclusions as they continue to learn. It enables calibration with tutors and peers across a range of important scales, depth of colour, strength of aroma, intensity and length of palate and levels of sweetness, acidity, tannin, alcohol and body. The use of a lexicon gives taste a common language for describing aromas and flavours within, yes, a necessarily constrained band. Mind you, it is a tad Eurocentric, not yet quite reflecting the array of flowers and fruits encountered in Asia and beyond. Tasters methodically work through the wine's appearance, nose and palate before drawing a conclusion based on the sacred quartet of balance, length, intensity and complexity. To get to grips with this, we taste some clearly delineated wines in session one, a simple Pinot Grigio, say, an aroma bomb in the guise of a Gewürztraminer, a Chardonnay with overt winemaking influences such as New Oak and Lee's Contact, a light, chillable, low tannin red in the shape of Beaujolais Village, and a tannic, full-bodied red exemplified here by Barolo. We also briefly look at wine faults, storage and service, and food pairing. The functional focus of this last one gives an idea of Level 2's basic approach. It promotes an awareness of the structural components of the wine and the standout characteristics of a dish, and then provokes an assessment of how and why the interaction of the two might be good, bad, or indifferent. Session 2, we move on to factors influencing the production of red wines. This includes an in-depth look at grape growing, the vine's growing cycle, how environmental influences in the vineyard, think climate, weather, latitude, altitude, aspect, topography, soil, water, air, impact the ripeness and quality of grapes and how human choices intersect with those and to what effect. We look at winemaking too, from harvesting and receiving the grapes through fermentation and maturation. Pinot Noir and Zinfandel are our models. The former fancies cooler climates and grows wherever anyone can make a good fist of it, and the latter is happy in the warmer parts of California and in southern Italy, where they call it Primitivo. Then it's over to Rosé, White and Sweet Wines for Session 3, when Riesling, Chenin Blanc, Semillon and Ferment step into the spotlight. It's important to note, much as this could look like a whistle-stop, wine fueled joyride that leaves relative newcomers dazed, that this is all about the gradual accruing of new knowledge with constant consolidation of recently gleaned wisdom, plus reinforcement of the links between concepts. Indeed, those detractors of WSET who see it as a process of brainwashing, well, they're right if they mean that course writers and examiners want these theory and tasting concepts and methods to become second nature to students. And so it is that we recap factors in the vineyard and winery that these wines have in common with reds, and look at those junctures where the paths to white, rosé and sweet wines might diverge. Labelling terms also come into focus. In session two, we introduce protected designation of origin and protected geographical indication, respectively the European Union's top and second highest tier of legally defined provenance. 
The former PDO takes in the Appellation Controle system of France, the DOCs and DOCGs of Italy, the DOs and DOCAs of Spain, the Qualitätswein and Prädikatswein of Germany, etc. The latter, PGI, covers France's Vin de Pays, Spain's Vino de la Tierra, Italy's Indicazione Geografica Tipica, and Germany's Landwein. Yep, I know, acronym overload and bureaucratic alarm bells are ringing, but you can only run from this labelling stuff for so long, and head-on is the only way to go. Again, there's constant reinforcement as we travel the world and look at the rationale and ramifications of these labelling laws. Session 3 is a chance to tackle a few more style-related terms. Late harvest Alsatian wines labelled Von Lange Tardive, Germany's ascending ripeness scale of Cabernet, Spätlaser and Auslaser, and noble rot sticky such as Beeren Auslaser from Germany and Azu in Hungary. By session 4 we've well and truly found our feet and are starting to roam. Time for important international white varieties with a few regionally important aromatics thrown in for good measure. All the way we talk about varietal characteristics, those properties of a grape variety that are held to be innate, before specific growing conditions or winemaking techniques give them a slightly different accent. Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc and Pinot Gris slash Grigio are the big guns here, made in vast quantities the world over. In a standard WSET manoeuvre, we start with the classics, Chablis and the Côte de Beaune in Burgundy for Chardonnay, say, Sancerre and Puy Fumé in the Loire for Sauvignon Blanc, before travelling to the far-flung corners of the so-called New World where these grapes have firmly and distinctly taken root. The uber-fragrant Gewürztraminer is treated as a speciality of Alsace, Viognier is looked at chiefly in its northern Rhone context, and Albarino is the preserve of Rias Baixas in Spain. Session 5, Merlot, Cabernet Sauvignon and Syrah slash Shiraz. Looks pretty compact until you remember that Cabernet Sauvignon is the world's most planted grape variety and that its Bordeaux blending partner Merlot is also a popular grape that changes a fair bit depending on the climate where it's grown. Bordeaux itself has a fair bit of detail to it, plus we look at the whys and wherefores of blending, then hit the likes of Napa, Sonoma, Stellenbosch, Margaret River, Kunawara and Chile's Central Valley. Syrah means a trip to the Northern Rhone. Shiraz is largely a South Australian affair at this level. Session 6 has us in the home straight, looking at important red grapes that have a particularly strong association with a certain region. We look at Gamay in Beaujolais, Grenache slash Garnacha in the Southern Rhone, Spain and South Australia, Tempranillo in Spain, then Chilean Carmenere, Argentinian Malbec and South African Pinotage. When we taste, some of these will be firsts for the students. Getting a handle on typicity is important, seeing in the glass what we read in the textbook and infer from the label, but we're also linking back what we see in the glass to the vineyard and the winery. As well as those innate varietal properties, we think about how those things in the vineyard, climate, weather, latitude, altitude, aspect, topography, soil, water, air, might make it smell, taste and feel like this. And what about the winery, those primary aromas derived from the fruit and its alcoholic fermentation, the secondary characteristics issuing from post-fermentation winemaking, and the tertiary flavours that have emerged as the wine has developed. The penultimate session is an all-out Italian job. Whites courtesy of Cortese in the northwest, Garganega in the northeast, Verdicchio in the centre and Fiano in the south. And then reds, Nebbiolo and Barbera from the northwest, Corvina from the northeast, Sangiovese and Montepulciano from the centre. Italy has tons of interesting indigenous varieties and it's nice to dip a toe in here. By this stage, the benefits of tasting together guided by the SAT shows as we navigate virgin territory for some people. It might be your first Fiano di Avellino but methodically working through the appearance, nose and palate allows us to see it for what it is. And going back to what's behind the label, it mightn't have been obvious that these are the grapes behind such restaurantless mainstays as Gavi, Suave, Barolo, Chianti and Valpolicella. Session 8 is split into sparkling wines and fortifieds. Grape growing and, more especially, winemaking are examined as Champagne and Carver fly the flag for the traditional method, Prosecco does the job for the tank method and Asti, funnily enough, does the honours for the Asti method. Often at this level, the steps involved and the time, cost and hassle of producing traditional method sparkling are a bit of an eye-opener. And we end up in the Iberian Peninsula for a brief look at fortified winemaking. Fino, Amontillado and Oloroso Sherry are on the menu from Andalusia, Spain, before we hop across the border to the Duro Valley in Portugal to look at Ruby, Tawny, Late Bottle Vintage and Vintage Port. Always nice to end on a port. After that, in what would be the ninth and final session, the students sit an exam. 50 multiple choice questions in 60 minutes. In general, students appear to take this part well within their stride, and in fact are often a little surprised at the giant strides they've taken across the wide world of wine in a relatively short period of time. As well as a sense of comfort around a wide range of wines and speaking about them in front of other people, there's no reason why this whole journey shouldn't have been a whole heap of fun too.